David, it's such a delight to meet you on video. Um, Absolutely. Thanks so much for for taking the time to follow up with me. Yeah. Um, so so uh, no, you're clear clearly uh, an expert in in branding. Can you can you tell us the story of how that started? How did you uh, become a branding expert? Where did that start? Well, I started. I mean, started my career in, in Manhattan, in New York. That's where I started as a designer, specifically on logos. But I found that that was the sort of the tip of the iceberg. It's kind of like when one learns. Here's my the best analogy. It's like one either learning to be a very specialized function in a really excellent kitchen or learning to be a classically trained musician. Now, you could be a classically trained musician. You can have incredible technical skills. You can have incredible talent. Um, you could be in the top of your game. But as that specialized talent, you don't have the ability to say, I don't like the way that that entire orchestral piece actually came out. It could have been better. Uh, you couldn't that you couldn't impact how far something could how how much something could ascend toward to, to be even better than it was. You were one piece. You were one note in the entire keyboard of a piano. And I was like, mm. so I so that was the that was the point where, okay, I there were certain things I didn't. And I love it. And people still talk about them and they go, oh my God, this, you did this logo, you did this, you did this. Yes. But it was one piece of the, one element of the conversation. I like, I like taking ownership for ensuring that there's a great outcome. And I can't do that from just one little specialized corner. So it was just a matter to me, it was a matter of more responsibility and ownership for what is this ultimately going to be? Is it going to be a remarkable experience for the people that will encounter this? Or are they going to see one little piece and then the rest is going to leave them wanting more? You know? It's great. It's beautiful. Um, so you know, all of us, all of us are influenced by our context. Um, how do you think your upbringing in Brooklyn and Queens uh, influenced uh, both your your career path and also your your skills and your talents? Well, I was always I was always a, we had a habit of going to Greenwich Village very often. We would go to the West Village. We would go to Washington Square Park. We would go and we'd go to the art the art shows, etc. And I and so I was always exposed, and I always loved the art i love the culture i love the street performers i love the smell of food in the air i love the mu street musicians i love all the various things and so what ended up happening was i really became a sponge i was always fascinated with these things that would make me like mm, what's that incredible smell what type of food is that or oh wow what is that incredible piece of artwork that i see here um that's very unusual what what what's the material made of or or how is this catching the light differently or 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 so i was always fascinated with the, the things that made me take a double take that made that that stood out because there's no shortage anybody that knows new york there's no shortage of things clamoring to get your attention well why is it that certain things and that's why my website rising above the noise.com right it's like it's it was why are certain things able to stand out rise above the general noise level that's out there on any of the sensory levels that was basically that's basically what what created the sort of the lane that i chose that's fascinating so you're saying like like the whole energy of new york is was like a lesson in branding of how to stand out from the noise i think so i think so you know, it was, it was, it's like, cause I was always, I, I was always a little, I was always inquisitive in my own, in my own way. I was like, Hmm, wow. Why, how that's interesting. That real, that, that caught my eye that made me oh, awaken my senses that made me open my eyes and notice a new color spectrum or wow. That was those harmonies from these musicians 
I never heard harmonies exactly like that. That was remarkable um, because every day, everything has the opportunity as it is the choice. Will it be ordinary or will it be extraordinary? Why is one conversation ordinary? Why is another extraordinary? Why is one book ordinary? Why is another extraordinary? Why when one person plays piano, it's like, okay, another person plays piano and you're like, you're mesmerized. You're like, oh my God, mm -hmm. what's the divide? There's a dividing line there between the ordinary, you know, what, I mean, a blank, because I, because I was also, I was a fine artist in, in, in my teens. I mean, I've been, I've, so I, I, how do you take a white canvas to canvas? One, per, you give that same canvas to two different people. You give the same paints to those two different people. One creates something you go, eh, where's the nearest garbage? And the other one, you're going, oh my God, wow, it's it's it, it's immersed you into a whole new world. That's a fascinating, really fascinating analogy to, to fine art. Like, you know, as you know, in arts, some arts for, to the untrained eye, some art, like you said, looks like it's any child could do it. Let's say, for example, let's take a Jackson Pollock painting. From a, so clearly, there was brilliant branding behind behind these. That can you explain from a branding perspective what is it that makes let's say that that work of art different than something that child would do that would, would mimic that. I think that there's an invisible component. I mean, like why did Andy Warhol take off? You know, why did, why did um, certain musical acts take off? I think that there's an un, I think there's an invisible factor to me. That invisible factor is, conviction i think it's conviction that's right why is it that someone could why is it that, that let's again take it down to something very practical we could have two people walk into a room one person and they're both dressed comparably one person permeates the room you're like you're like what do they without them them ever saying a word just their own beingness that permeates and the other kind of is a wallflower they kind of like shrink into the background it's not the clothes it's not their hair gel you know it's not uh who who has the more the more nicely groomed must beard mustache whatever it's not it's like there's that that's why i call it the invisible factor which i see as conviction hmm. they know what they stand for hmm. they don't you know it's like it's like we've all experienced people who are apologetic and tentative and then there are those who are unapologetic doesn't mean that they're abrasive but they take a firm stand they stand for something they don't waver about it and they're not tentative about it we can feel that it's like that invisible factor that we all are able to perceive and feel. It's great. It's a great answer. Beautiful. Um, so you mentioned it's it's related, but but I think I think it's I think it's um it's a little different, but it's related. You mentioned in your interview the distinction between confidence and arrogance. So so how do you describe that again? How do you elaborate on that? And how does that that apply to your career journey? Well, I mean. I definitely had both. I think arrogance, I think the difference between confidence and arrogance is that arrogance is confidence without actually ever taking inventory of what's the rest of the world. <laughs> it's, almost, it's almost a little narcissistic in its way, you know, whereas confidence is like, I've looked around, I've taken inventory. I recognize these other things. They're fine. I don't have to dominate them. I don't have to eclipse them. I don't have to get contentious with them. I recognize them. And I also recognize what I have to deliver here. Um, that to me is confidence. That to me also is something that's healthy and rational because it's inclusive. It's not something that seeks to be exclusive like i'm the only now with all that said you take someone like i was a great fan of muhammad ali i loved muhammad ali i thought he was 
the greatest showman, an amazing athlete, but also an incredible showman and a great storyteller. And he played with his listeners and he challenged their thinking. And some might say, and, and I remember I remember actually being annoyed about this when I, as I was coming up because I've been doing this for 45 years now. And I remember there were some people who said, oh, you're too excited about this. That's, that's, really, that's really braggadocious. I said, I said, BS. That's braggadocious. I said, I'm excited about what I actually believe. Now, it, it took me some years to actually realize that that was a false standard. That was the, the, the weakest thing and the weakest minds. All they seek to do is label. If I don't agree with you, I'm going to label you that you're a fill in the blank and whatever, what, you know, you, you label them with some, something that's distasteful and that's, that, that puts them in a bucket of something that's, uh, you know, rejectable. And that's the easiest, simplest trick. Um, I didn't know that it, it took me, you know, years, you know, to, to recognize, oh, that was, that's just a tactic. That's a, that's a very weak mind that that's all they have to do is, oh, I don't agree with you. Therefore, I'm going to label you. Therefore, I'm going to demean you. And that way you don't, you cease to have any relevance. Well, I'm sorry that that's the only game you can play, man. The weak minds and the weak people are the ones who have to basically take away from others to feel that they are making any progress. Whereas a, a healthy mind and a really, and a, a true leader and someone who's truly beneficial will seek to, they their ability to create um, an impact in the world doesn't mean that they have to take away from others. It's like, there's plenty of fish in the sea. There's a big, a big ocean. There's plenty of sky to build buildings into, there's skyscrapers into. So it's just, it's balancing all those factors. It's very beautiful. So you started your, uh, your, your newsletter, the Brand Liberation Journal. So I just, I'm just curious about the name. Is it a fascinating name? What did you have in mind when you, when you gave it that title? Well, it's the bottom line is is too too many brands are seeking. They're they're looking at, um, they get they get branding and marketing confused, and branding and marketing are actually two two distinct functions. Branding is what you do to differentiate yourself in the world to give yourself a unique voice. How do how do others tell tell with what I'm offering against what else is out there? And marketing's job is to now take that branding information and spread those seeds, because because ultimately, when you get down to it, sales is harvest is, is actually the harvesting of the seeds that have been planted. So it goes branding, marketing, sales. Well, branding is the one that actually will allow us to identify. What are these seeds and how are they different? Um, so when it comes to this brand liberation, I wanted to make sure that it's like, you know what? If you know, if you really understand branding, you have the opportunity to liberate your value. You have the opportunity to liberate your ideas. You have the opportunity to, to unshackle them, hence the concept of liberation, unshackle them from me to copy, just copying, modeling something else, and actually having that distinction and doing it with great joy and great. Uh, an element of celebration. it's it's something that's exciting. You know, we've all been to we've all gone to restaurants. Isn't it great when you when you have a have a chance? I mean, we've all talked many, we've probably talked to many chefs. Some of the chefs are just like they're grinding, uh, 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 and they're not. And then you get, in case you get that, just the, they're in their element, and they are just glowing, and they're they're breathing life into every dish. That's liberation. To me, that's the opportunity. That that again is one of those choice points. What choice do we want to make when we're busy at work and living life? Do we want to grant the a sense of being to others? into what they're doing and br just breathing life into, into stuff. Life is fun. Life is made up of ideas and stories and, and life is this great canvas, you know, and all we got to do is like squeeze those tubes just a little more and get some of that good pigment out there and paint something great. <laughs> so your answer sparked another question that I've always had, which is um, like, 
certain like movements have a, like a moniker, they have a name, like let's say like um you know defund the police, right? Or Me Too. So I think defund the police. I think uh, President Obama said that was like the worst the worst choice, you know, for a, a movement. But let's say me, use Me Too as a pejorative. Do you think the Me Too movement chose the wrong name? Um, I think I, I think the problem with with, with me too, um, like many of these things, was they they were grounded. They were based on on a divisiveness. They weren't based on an inclusiveness. Me too. Set so see anytime that there's an there's a a, a lack of truth in something, it's it, it, people kind of are like it kind of you go, what's wrong with that? Me too. Does, it's like it's like it's already in a in a in a it's it's taking a stance of of victimization and division as opposed to hey by the way you know how about you two how about you two what if, what if it just flipped that way it was like you two it's like oh we're actually here to recognize and empower because i was even talking with uh, with a colleague a couple days ago and there's when you're dealing with work there are two there are two ways that i see work can be done you know especially from the from a founder owner entrepreneur leader position one is looking at it one can look at it and go well how do i get my work done today how do i justify my paycheck um how do I get more deals? Now that's all of every one of those questions is, is like, how, how do I get, how do I get? What if that was actually approached from a different standpoint, such as how do I make others superstars? The context is 180 degrees different. You're not gonna have the same conversations with that as a foundation compared to the first as a foundation. The first as a foundation is transactional. It's what's in it for me. The second one is what's in it for you. And to and my metric is how much am I elevating those around me? Hmm. That's that's a game. That's a game that that builds upon itself and that's a game that where everybody truly wins. Hmm. The other one is a winner and there's a loser. Hmm. The other one is there's a winner and then there are, are even bigger winners. Hmm. So you're smart. You're saying that's when you consult for companies to improve their branding, you're you're thinking and you're conveying how can I make them into superstars? How can I make their brand a superstar? Absolutely. It's very smart. Yeah. That's great. Beautiful. Um so so I I want to hear your thoughts. So I I've always appreciated um Seth Godin's a distinction between advertising and branding. And I think this is a little different than what, it's a different, um, it's not, a, it's apples and oranges. He says that advertising is saying what you do and then branding is why why we should believe you. Why, is that, is that a, is that a different or is that a different philosophy than you have or is that, is that similar? I would, I'd say, I'd say it's complimentary. Um, I mean, it also parallels a little bit with Simon Sinek is like, people don't buy what you, what you, what you make, but actually, you know, why you make it right. It parallels with that, um, which I very much do appreciate because, it, it, and, and there's this point, which I don't think many people understood when they were talking about it. I think, I think it opened up a lot of eyes as to like, oh, what's, what should we be talking about? And what I found was in the in the discussion, when I when I'm creating a brand, when I'm working with a company, the thing that I go over is the greatest brands in the world are built on values. This parallels to this point you're asking about. And I say, let me give you two examples that we all know. Nike has built an empire based on three words just do it it's not based on we make the coolest looking sneakers we make the hippest looking shirts we make the. it's like it's not just trying to pitch the, the that it's like just do it and they had stories and just do it was the punchline that's a values-based 
brand. And when Steve Jobs came back to Apple and Apple was struggling and it was on the verge of going out of existence, he had to kind of come out with the campaign and worked with uh, TBWA and came out with the Think Different campaign. What I thought was brilliant about that, and it was covered in the biography on Steve Jobs, was at, the, at that time, one of the questions that was asked was, when you want to know somebody really fast, ask them who their heroes are, mm. Mm. which I always thought was ingenious. Mm. Because if you look at the Think Different campaign, none of those people ever used a computer. I mean, because you have you have everyone from Einstein to Miles Davis to John Lennon to Picasso to Martha Graham to uh, to Amelia Earhart to all these uh, Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Muhammad Ali, etc. So you had all these people who were none of which were ever in the same socioeconomic circles. They never would have met except maybe in some international, global something. But they really their circles did not overlap. None of them ever used computers. None of them ever used an Apple computer, but it wasn't about that. It was about think different. It was about here's to the crazy ones. And I always love that, but there's, but there's just two examples. Those are built on values. There are some companies today that try to the, that they try to model their pitch based on values. It's very shallow. It's very insincere. It's not authentic. And we all know it we can tell, you know, it's, um, so it's just, it, and the values and the, and not all values, there's, there's gazillion, a gazillion colors of gray in terms of values. You could take a company like liquid death and they're, and they're, and they're just out of their minds with fun and humor and stuff, but that's their set of values It parallels. And that was that you have just do it. You have think different. You have liquid death, you have Patagonia, you have, you have all of these different brands. You have Harley Davidson, right? These are all brands that are built on values. So to me, it's, it's, if you can really tap into, you know, like I cringe whenever my wife and I go on, on Delta, because I, I see, I see the CEO give his little spiel of like, you know, he's, he's, he's a talking suit. I mean, it's not, it's not it, there's nothing. It's not like, you know what, if you're going to talk to me, show me how you are when you're at home, when you're hanging out, what do you, what do you actually like? Because you're just standing there with your suit, your pressed suit, your tie and your script. And it's a script. It's not a communication. Um, so that's, that's the thing. And I think, I think we all have a great deal of opportunity to tell a better story, but a real one, you know, what's our, what's our voice? What do you, what do you really give a damn about? So I love call. I love calling out when I'm working with, 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 clients and CEOs I'm calling out and saying, now you just said blah, 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 blah. Did you really mean that? Is that really, is that really your legacy? Is that what you want to be known about? And sometimes they, they all of a sudden it catches them off guard and they're like, I actually said that. And he goes, no, I, I didn't mean that at all. I'm sorry. I've been saying that for so many years, but I'm the one that gets them to pause and look and go, whoa, I haven't even, I've just been kind of on autopilot. Amazing. Now, as as you mentioned mentioned the, the introduction about Steve Jobs, about saying how a person is who, who his heroes are, it reminded me that there's actually this actually a Jewish a Jewish idea comes from from Proverbs. It's also a short moniker. He writes three words: it's Ish Kafi Mahalala, which means man is who he praises. Man is who man is in accordance with who he praises. So I think it's it's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, there's there's also there's also another one from um, South Africa. It's a it's a, a, I forget the the exact language, but it's like um, I am because you are. Mm. You mm. know, like so it's it it's that recognition. It's that recognition of mm. um, mm. Our, our, our really of our brotherhood. That's great. That's beautiful. Yeah. I am because I am because you are. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Amazing. Um, you mentioned to me another like very clever um, idea. You sp spoke about the concept of shooting more of the wrong ammunition. 
can can you elaborate on that what that means and how how does that yeah how that relates to marketing and and its implications for business well um many a real majority of companies um do what i call reactive uh branding and reactive marketing well this is what's happening out there so we're going to just react to it and now i don't have a problem with reacting to something if something is really um you know, not, it, it, you always have to have a hero and a villain when you're dealing with branding. But the more important thing is, is are we asking the right questions in the first place? Let's not just jump into a dialogue because it's the dialogue it's been having. It's like, let's go, okay, is this the actual conversation that we should be having? Is this because I'm a real advocate for, taking an honest look at something to come to a true, a workable conclusion. And what ends up occurring is, and I've, and I've always, I, I use this repeatedly is that people will not come to new conclusions based on old information. Hmm. What happens is, is that every, every conversation up till this very moment, like right now that you and I are having, is old information. Now, in this conversation, we've talked, touched upon this and touched upon that. And touched upon, that's opening up new doors. That's opening up new possibilities. That's now introducing elements, allowing us to connect dots that usually remain unconnected because no one bothered to say, wait a second, is that all there is? Or why not this? So I really advocate are we having the conversation we should be having? Is this really? I don't, I, I reject wholeheartedly late, what I call lazy thinking or lazy observation. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. That's the way, that's the way it is. Let's just sit back and just sort of accept it. What is it? You know, is that, is that everything? I'm going to satisfy my curiosity. I'm going to say, is that everything that it could be? Is that, can, can it be more? Why not, why not, why not do X, Y, Z? Because there's always, the, there's always the opportunity for something remarkable to happen. There really is, you know, and, and after doing this for four and a half decades, um, I, I can tell you for, I mean, I've done this for what, however many thousands of companies that have done this for, around the globe in the most disrelated industries in the most from startups to billion dollar companies um, to really well funded to not funded well at all to industries that were struggling to industries that didn't exist. There's always been the opportunity to find a differentiator because we notice things that are different. We don't, if, if, if you know it's it's like the, there's that element where the littlest subtle shades of gray put side by side it's like by the time that you the only way you would notice that there were different shades of gray let's say you had 10 10 shades of gray next to each other and each was just a little little subtle change you wouldn't be able to notice the change but now you take the one the one at the end and the one at the beginning, and you put those two together, all of a sudden you go, oh my God, they're not even in the same range. You, but Because we needed that much of a dividing line that differentiates mm -hmm. one to the other. Mm -hmm. Little subtle incremental tentative, little incremental shifts are hard, if not impossible to notice. Mm -hmm. That's very smart. Um, okay, we're, we could wind up now, and this has been a really, really uh, um, uplifting and inspirational and educational uh, talk for me, uh, and, and and grateful to you. Um, can you tell us more about your upcoming book, Rich Brand, Poor Brand, and uh, its you know its, its themes and you know, how we could how we could how we could buy any of your books. Well, I mean, yeah, definitely go to go to Amazon or Barnes and Noble or Books a Million and you can go to any of those and you can and you can get a brand of dimension really is is the thing that 
that probably i mean i've had people literally take the take the book and i and and i kid you not the type is the usual size font for a book is about 12 point my my font size is 36 point <laughs> i because i had a pet peeve i was i i didn't like reading 300 page books that always somewhere in the middle of the, the those there was like 10 or 15 pages that were amazing they were what i called the stuff they were the reward well i didn't realize i was going on a treasure hunt right everything before it was sort of you know setting things up for that and then everything after was a little extrapolation well what ended up happening is is that so i did the, i did this and i it was very funny because i showed it to my daughter who's a millennial and she goes this is great dad you get me i'm like what are you talking about she goes, you you get me. Um, I said, what do you mean? She goes, this is like a tweet. I'm like, because it's, because it's the type is so big on each page. Because I my viewpoint is, if I can say something in five in five sentences, why do I need to do it in five chapters just to fill out a book? That's that to me shows disrespect to the reader, <laughs> and I value my time and I value my reader's time. So so the thing so 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 that so that's the that's the thing on that, and then. So that so that that's what happened there, um, and then the other part that was hysterical when the book finally came out, and I saw the first person who was over like fifty plus in age, they looked at the they looked and they opened the book and they beamed, and they're like and they said finally I'm like what they said a book I can read without my cheaters which cracked me up, so I had no idea that that I, that, that was, so I hit it on both fronts so I love that. So the new book is going to follow the same. That's now part of my brand for sure. But here's what I basically wrote as far as a preamble on the new book is that you won't find this asset that I cover in this book on a balance sheet and you won't learn it in business school. Yet it's been the holy grail for overachievers, yeah. often within reach, but missed by a mile. Yeah. What I'm talking about is that magic ingredient that made everything from the Seinfeld sitcom to the Rolling Stones, from PayPal to the Rat Pack, and from Motown and the Declaration of Independence, not only possible, but inevitable. That is basically what rich brand, poor brand is all about. Tapping into that reservoir of brilliance mm. that's staring you and me in the face mm. to build a brand that the world not only needs, but wants. Mm. That is what rich brand, poor brand, because it's how to unleash your David in a world of Goliaths. That's the subhead of it. Rich brand, poor brand, how to unleash your brand, your or not, I'll get, how to unleash your David in a world of girl of Goliaths. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Well, David, it's been such an honor to meet you. I uh, hope we can continue to stay in touch. I'd Absolutely. Love, I'd love to, yeah, have, happy to, to do other, 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 other topics with you and, if you, ever, if you have any clients that you think would, would appreciate our, our approach, you know, 30 Magazine approach, you're happy, happy to, any of your clients are happy to include. Uh, in the 30 that, sounds, that sounds great. No, I totally appreciate that. And are you, are, what are you planning on doing with uh, with with uh, what we talked about today? Yes, I'm going to include it in, our, in the article that, that you did before. I'm going to include that and then I'll be shared again with this follow-up. Oh, fabulous. Fabulous. Well, definitely tag me and I will, I will reshare it as well, for sure. For and sure. Hey, David, thank you so much for your time, and I wish you continued success and good health. Absolutely. You as well, Yuzi. Thank you so much. My pleasure, David. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye.